this podcast is going to be read or listened to by about a million lo- Londoners. And I think it's fascinating to see, uh, to have read your work and to hear you talk, to realise the extent of sadness in a lot of relationships. Uh, you mentioned in your talk the difference between communities in the past and communities in the present mm. and how they impact on relationships. And I wonder if that would be a good starting point, just briefly explain for people listening and reading what the differences are and why they make relationships difficult. So the communities of the past um, where you know, the villages defined us. You, uh, you had duties, you had obligations, you knew what was expected of you, um, you knew who you were, you knew where you belonged, and you had not much choice, not much freedom, but also not much uncertainty. The community that we live in today is a complete self-created community. You have to create your own community. You're not just living in one that is assigned to you. So you get to choose, but in order to know to choose, you need to know what you like, you need to know to find it, you need to be sure about what you found, you need to be dealing with the uncertainty and the loneliness when you don't find it. So we have a lot more freedom and we are a lot more alone. We have a lot fewer guidelines and we have a lot more uncertainty. Um, the digital community allows us to experience enormous support immediately from thousands of people, but sometimes you have a thousand friends online and nobody that you can ask to feed your cat. Um, so it's both and. I mean, it's, it's really, I, you can in a moment have such a tremendous group of people surrounding you while you're sitting alone in your house. Um, I think what's difficult today is that um, you have, I mean, we not only do we have to choose, but we have to choose within a, a, a sea of choices. So you suddenly have to know yourself in ways that was not so important. If you know yourself, if you don't know yourself, so what? Today I have to know myself. I have to know what I care about, what my values are, what I aspire to, who inspires me. And from that place I go and I find the people in my life. So when it works, our satisfaction is superior to anything that has ever preceded. But for many of us, it is a hard task. Mm. So how does that impact on relationships? I mean, look, in the past, and in intimate relationships, uh, you know, I got together with you so that we could weather the storms, we could walk the land, we could feed the children. We were dealing with survival needs. On the Maslow ladder, we now don't need, I don't need to partner with you for survival. I can survive by myself, I can survive in a community of friends. I partner with you for the higher level needs, for the self-actualization, for the generative needs, for the, the stuff that's going to bring out the better parts of me, the transcendent parts of me and all of that. That's a whole different reason for being together. Um, much more abstract in some way. You know, what does it mean that I'm going to self-actualize myself in my relationship with you? It means that you are going to encourage me to become even more of whom I already, I already am, which you chose in the first place. Um, it's very inspiring. It's very inspiring. It, it's not a relationship in which you feel stuck and kind of just have to deal with the everyday for the rest of your life. And the only thing you could hope for in the past is that you died younger. You know, if today you you can leave, you can create, but you have a lot less structure. And where we go, I think we need a community. You know, when you had community, you had no privacy and no individuality. Now you have plenty of privacy and individuality, and you are often way too alone. We need something that brings those two things together. Mm -hmm. We need community that allows for individuality. We need a community that gives freedom, but also creates continuity and tradition. We need, because we, we can't live like, we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back to the past. And we really struggle with the present. Why do we struggle? Because everything is up. I have to make everything up. I have to create everything myself with you. And I have to talk with you about sex. I have to talk with you about sexual boundaries. I have to talk with you about my desires for others. I have to talk with you about intimacy, about infidelity. Do you know how many hard conversations we need to be able to have these days? 
Who talked about any of this before? We didn't. Because we didn't expect this kind of intimacy. We didn't expect this kind of closeness. You know who, where you found your closeness of the couples of the past? Women found it with other women and men found it with other men. You didn't look for that kind of closeness with your partner who you call your best friend and your trusted confidant and your passionate lover all in one. We ask one person today to give us what once an entire village used to provide. <laughs> yeah. Okay? That's a lot. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, it struck me when you were talking to know which subjects to broach and actually which not to. That's right. That's hard. That's also hard for a man. We, especially us British men, mm -hmm. we're brought up pretty reserved, not mm -hmm. necessarily uh, expressive with our emotions and not necessarily descriptive with our partners about our emotions. And knowing that it's good to talk about stuff, I certainly think that, mm -hmm. but it's not good to talk about everything. No, no. We live in a model, especially in the Anglo-Saxon model, that believes sometimes that transparency means closeness. And in the culture of individualism, everything I experience matters. So everything I feel should be said, and you should care about it. And I happen to think that some things need not be said. Plus, I also think we don't just talk with words. And I don't buy the idea that men are not expressive. It's not true. They express differently. And if we didn't just have a feminized model of relationships in which we want men to sometimes act more in the female version because women used to carry relationships, then I think we will see that there is a broader range. You know, men come into my office and they say, I'm, she's the talker. And I say, what do you mean? And then they start talking to me for 17 minutes straight. <laughs> And then I say, this is an amazing thing. Continue to think that she's the talker and tell me more of what you think. Mm. If you give them space, they talk plenty. And then you sometimes need to help them connect the dots and articulate certain things, but they're feeling plenty. They don't always have the words for it, but then you look at their face, then you look at their body, and they're expressing loads. Because we know we speak with our body for 18 months before we utter the first word. Mm. Body speak. This notion that it has to be put in words all the time, not everybody can do it. And sometimes some men are not good talkers and then you tell them, tell me, are you a writer? And then they write to you a thing and it's like, you know, and she never thought, she or he, the partner, never thought that any of this existed inside of them. And sometimes they're painters, and sometimes they build a bookshelf, and sometimes they build, you know, a piece of furniture with love that is, um, you know. And in that sense, I like Chapman's Five Languages of Love. I think it's a very brilliant idea because it really tells you there are lots of ways to show feelings, to show that you care. You know, one guy drives his wife every morning to work. One guy prepares coffee for his boyfriend or tea or, you know, wakes up the, and and makes breakfast every morning. One guy, and all of these, to me, are expressions of feelings. Mm. If we broaden it a little bit, then there's lot, many more people can enter into the definition. If we just keep it to, I feel this, and right. I want to, conf you know, then only very few people are actually articulate. Mm. And this is so useful because I'm interested in talking to you about the theory and the philosophy of relationships mm -hmm. and monogamy and infidelity, but also the practicalities of what people can do. You know, you talk about nonverbal communication there. That resonates with me quite a bit. Um, I've done quite a bit of therapy over the last couple of I years. I mean, I have a lot of guys, you know, they sit, their partner gets moved, men or women partner. Mm. And I just say, what, what happens to you right now? I said, if you were home, what would you want to do? I would want to put my hand on them. I said, well, then just do that. Mm. You know, that's sometimes that's, that is plenty of feeling, you know. And I think particularly for men who often have not been given the words, the body remains the place where they experience the most tenderness, softness, vulnerability, surrender, kind. You know, it's through the body, and, and, and especially the sexualized body, actually. The body and sexuality have always been for men the sanctioned languages for love and closeness. And you were talking about communication and, and nonverbal communication. I think I grew up in a family where there's a tremendous amount of love, but often 
um, not very much was spoken about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there was a problem, it wouldn't necessarily be communicated in very direct ways, but in some kind of slightly indirect way, it would be displeasure or anger or whatever mm -hmm. it might be would be communicated. Um, and what did you work on in therapy? I, well, firstly, articulating mm -hmm. the issue directly. Mm -hmm. You know, and also working out when it's good to express it and when it's good not to. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, in terms of my previous relationships, I've, I told you my girlfriend's here, but I've not had particularly long relationships in the mm -hmm. past. And one of the, one of the things I think is that I wasn't very good at communicating my needs, mm -hmm. but I was good at trying to communicate them in unspoken ways, mm -hmm. or to be honest, slightly passive aggressive mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's, you got annoyed if she didn't get the message. Yeah. And, and you felt like you're always the one picking up on everybody else's needs because you're so good at reading indirect communication from others. But, and then you got upset. Why is it that I know what other people need without them having to tell me, whereas I have to put, you know, and why can the, these people not see what I, what I want without having to put it in a message underneath their pillow? Mm. Something yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And I think another thing that always worried me about mm -hmm. relationships is that I noticed a great deal of subtext in communication of other relationships. You know, when, when it, it seemed to me that things weren't good in another relationship, I thought, I don't want that. That Those low-level, passive-aggressive relationships where people aren't making each other very happy, but they can't talk about it in the open. So for me, directness has been very mm -hmm, important. Mm -hmm. But as my own personal relationship develops and we get to know each other so well, of course, and people listening to this will relate, um, just a glance or a look or a sigh can mean so much, can't it? It's, it's, so, it's so much power. When In you both look. directions. Yeah. A smile, a wink, a moment of gazing, um, humor, um, a squint. I mean, actually, and then on the other side, and I raised eyebrow, <sighs> that one. Mm. You, where does that go? You're impossible. Fucking bitch. You are so annoying. Can't wait to get away from you. That mm. Uh, mm. frustrating, you know. Um, it's phenomenal how many sounds and small movements of the face we have that either show love, anger, disdain, fear. Yeah. And almost is so imperceptible and subtle that it's not fully picking a fight. But you know oh. they're going to notice it. Oh, no, no, no. It's not subtle. It's, it's subtle as in it's small, but it is, the message is very clear. Mm. You know, couples get destroyed on small, low-intensity warfare called bickering. And what's the solution to that? It is a kind of a chronic picking at the other person. Everything becomes an issue. And every issue leads to another issue. And it is just friction, like silex. Everything one person does, another person has a reaction against. And it's, but it's negative friction. It's heat, but it's not kind heat. It's conflictual heat. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a series of dead ends. Every time you do something, instead of saying, I don't like when uh, you hold this mic like this, I say, you know, I told you a thousand times not to put the mic this way. You're doing it just on purpose. It's because I told you that. I know, I know, I know you're doing that. It's like you attribute ill intent. You attribute intentionality. You don't just talk about the behavior. You talk about the entire person and you characterize them. You know, instead of saying, you know, you left a mess, you say, you're such a fucking mess. You know, you like, you, you, you and not only are you a mess, but you've always been a mess and nobody else would want to live with someone who is that kind of a mess and you're so lucky to have me tolerating your mess. I mean, um, it's very, very rich how people can make each other feel quite miserable. And how do you stop it? By taking, by taking yourself into account. It's not the other person who stops. It stops because you say, this is poison. 
I don't want to live this way and I am going to show up better. And instead of looking for everything the other person does wrong, you start to look for what, first of all, they do right. Mm -hmm. And you start to tell them because the tendency is to not say the good things and only point to the negative. So then you begin to change your you, you, you change lens. It's literally putting a new lens on you and now you're going to start looking for the things they do that is kind. Because maybe you are a mess, but in the meantime you went and you bought me a wonderful croissant that I like and you called me during the day to see if my meeting went well and you have done plenty of other things and I can now choose. Do I want to tell, I really enjoyed when you called me today, it was so nice, you know. I, well, you knew how nervous I was about this meeting and yet you checked in with me or do I want to come home and the first thing I want to say is you know you didn't pick up the stuff and you it really is a fundamental shift of me that I am going to look for the, the positive that I'm going to say it that I'm going to fill that bucket that I'm going to restrain my my freedom to just kind of say anything that I think think what you want you don't have to say it and then I'm going to work deliberately at creating a positive atmosphere between us, meaning I'm going to be kind myself. I'm going to do things for you just because it's you. Mm -hmm. That's plenty to start. I can fill up three pages of what a person is to, But you just begin with that. You wake up in the morning, and the first thing you do is you tell the person something nice. When you haven't done that in a long time, it is a major shift. Because your first thing is going to be, why should I? You do it. And you need to literally separate yourself from that loop and say, I'm going to do it because that's what I want to do and I'm going to stand accountable for myself regardless of you. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep doing it, not as a condition for, you know, I gained a few points and let's see if you're going to match me. Yeah. That's the sadness of relationship. All these games people play. Mm. All these power maneuvers, this is where people get really sad. They're in a relationship and, you know, which may have started out quite nice, but that friction, that chronic, conflictual, um, dark will eat them up alive. And relationships can make you feel in bliss and relationships can make you feel in hell. Mm. Um, I, the, the, I silenced you. <laughs> well, yeah, you did. Now, the gratitude is very, a very powerful way of instantly shifting the way that you, that, you, that any of us look about our partner, even if there's something that's causing a ma major annoyance. Like, for example, you you come back and you just say, you know, uh, today at the office, da 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 da, and I can just say, yeah, uh huh. Um, did you pick up the mail? Or I can say, wow. And then what happened? If you move toward, it's what he calls moving towards, moving away from and moving toward. And you move toward, meaning you engage with it. Mm. I make you feel that you matter. I make you feel that what you say interests me. That is the bread and butter of a relationship. The ability to continue to make the other person feel like their presence makes a difference. If you tell me this and I kind of do, uh-huh, and I move on to the next thing, I basically, over time, make you feel like you don't really count much, except mm. for the stuff you do around here. And that's when people say, I'm just a function. It's about what I do. It's about the fact that, you know, but it's not about who I am. And then they start to long to reconnect with a different kind of connection. Mm. And then looking a little bit deeper into mm -hmm. the kind of philosophy of relationships and where uh, where we're at right now, um, I heard you mention Chris Ryan's Sex at Dawn fairly mm -hmm. recently. Um, I wonder, is there some kind of myth around monogamy now in this in this year that we're living in? Is it harder than ever to be monogamous, and should we look for different ways to be in relationships? Well, you know, monogamy is a is a concept that has evolved dramatically throughout history. First of all, for most of history, monogamy had nothing to do with love. It was an economic imposition on women in order to know whose children these are and who gets the cows when I die. Monogamy was about property and lineage. 
It's only with romanticism that monogamy became the expression of love, the exclusiveness marked by my, by the sexual exclusivity and the ideal that I have chosen you. Mm. Monogamy is very different when it's one person for life versus one person at a time. Today, you're not monogamous in your fantasies and you're not necessarily monogamous in your memories. So monogamy is only in reality and reality is only one portion of your consciousness. Uh, monogamy is a continuum. Where does monogamy start? Is it my memories of my, my past relationship? Is it my fantasies? Is it flirting with somebody? Is being attracted to somebody? Is it just full-blown sex with somebody else? Monogamy is a continuum, and every relationship has an explicit monogamy agreement and an implicit monogamy agreement. The vows that you make publicly at your wedding and all the secret negotiation you do in your head. Oh, when I remember John or Mary, and I think about that time when I was on the beach, and oh, wow, that was such an incredible... That probably was one of my peak sexual experiences. You know, I, whenever I need to turn myself on, this is what I think about. Is that monogamy? Or am I being unfaithful in the moment? Unfaithful or simply not monogamous because I'm actually fantasizing about anybody else but the person who is next to me. It's a definite lack of presence. You can be present two minutes later. You can start with that because it gets you in the mood, and then after that, you're perfectly present. You know, so these are not fixed entities like that. Monogamy is very different when we no longer have virginity. That used to be the, the main boundary. Mm. Today, the boundary, you know, the boundary of sex pre-marriage was the moral sine qua non. And now it is the sex within marriage. But this has been evolving all along. And it is a fascinating conversation. Do, is monogamy a loyalty or is monogamy a fidelity? Is monogamy a, an emotional primacy, a commitment to one person? And it's much more of an emotional contract? In the, or is it really just about sexual exclusivity? And what does sexual exclusivity mean when you've had 10 years of sexual nomadism in which you could hook up plenty? And now, you know, I choose you and for you I renounce all the others. That's a very different concept of monogamy. So, in the West anyway. And um, what is infidelity? It's proclaimed monogamy and clandestine adultery. So right? does that mean that every couple, every Needs relationship, to negotiate. has its own rules? Yes, well, exactly. Today, you no longer can assume monogamy in a relationship and just think there is nothing to talk about because it's a given. Today... If you come to relationships in your early 30s and you have been at it for at least 10, 15 years, you bet you need to negotiate monogamy. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for you? Where does it start? And if you masturbate, is that your sexual privacy or is that a form of infidelity? And if you, you know, spend evenings at the bar with other people because you're at a conference away from home and you're talking for two hours with another woman in a very, very kind of engaged, active way. No, no actual touching, but we know that intense emotional conversations can be plenty erotic. Is that in, within the boundaries of the relationship or not? And That's a really good question. You understand, mm. today monogamy needs to be negotiated. It's an active conversation. And if you are in touch with your ex, even though you promise me that you no longer love her and you don't really mean it, but she's been a wonderful person in your life and you kind of broke up because you moved for a job to another part of the country. Are you allowed to remain friends with your ex? Does that exist? Or is it always going to be fraught because you, she once was your girlfriend? And all of these things don't have scientific answers. They have answers that are based on communication and trust. Do you think, I mean, Chris Ryan's argument is that pre-agriculture, we lived in small groups, mm -hmm. and I hope I'm paraphrasing this right, everyone had sex with everyone. Mm -hmm. No one knew who the father of the children was right. because everyone brought up the children together. Where I find that hard to get my head around is the fact that jealousy mm -hmm. and love between two people seems to be such a, such a strong, mm -hmm. strong emotions mm -hmm. that I can't imagine that the cavemen and women didn't mm -hmm. have jealousy as well. 
Um, monogamy is not natural. Monogamy is a choice and a practice. It's irrelevant if it's not natural or not. It doesn't. If you live in a structure, in a social structure, that in, that in, implies it, then monogamy is a practice. You know, you to remain faithful, to remain attentive to your partner, to remain actively engaged with your desire towards your partner, is a practice. It, it is to me. It's interesting to know what happened in history, but it doesn't help us with mm. the model that we chose today. If you want an exclusive relationship with your partner, jealousy has existed. There's an entire ev field of evolutionary psychology that looks at jealousy. Jealousy is one of the feelings that develops much later than fear and joy and sadness because jealousy requires an awareness of the self. And so it starts at 18 months. Mm -hmm. And in order to have that, jealousy also needs a triangle. It needs me to be jealous of you that you have taken something that should have come to me and brought it to somebody else. Envy is about something that I want and that I don't have. Jealousy is about something that I have and that you have taken elsewhere. Um, it's intrinsic to love. I believe that it comes with a certain element of possessiveness. Love and, and particularly passionate love and romantic love is sometimes possessive. It doesn't like to share. Uh, it wants you for me. And hence, when you go somewhere else, I'm jealous. I believe that on a small dose, that jealousy is actually a part of what fuels love. It makes me remain attentive. You know, in Latin cultures, jealousy is central, and people see it as a part and parcel of the experience of love. And you, you almost cultivate it a little bit. You know, um, it's my jealousy that's going to make me make sure that I conquer you back, that you keep your attention on me and all of that. In the Anglo-Saxon world, jealousy is a politically incorrect um, experience. Jealousy is an erotic wrath. That's really what it is. It's an erotic rage. Um, it is anger in it and, it, and it's highly sexualized at the same time. Americans, for example, very often tell you, I'm not jealous. I'm angry. It's like jealousy is a, they're proud not to be jealous. It's, n it's, it's a not politically correct emotion these days. You have to go to the opera to hear about jealousy, mm -hmm. not on the street. I happen to think more in the Latin version of it. I think that a little bit of jealousy is part of the experience of love and it's naturally so, and it's, it's a good thing. It keeps you on your toes. Sure you know, in my culture, you, when somebody wasn't jealous, you used to wonder if, if they love you. Right. If, if, they don't, yeah. if they don't want to hold you back a little bit, then they What's maybe wrong? don't love you enough. Yeah. So I come from that t tradition, mm. you know, and it, it's a cultural tradition. I remember very clearly thinking, jealousy is an expression of love. If you're not jealous, you mustn't love me that much. <laughs> There's nothing true about it, but mm. that was the cultural discourse. Mm. I'd like to finish by asking you one book that you would recommend people to read to get more involved in everything that you talk about in terms of successful relationships, whether it's monogamous or anything else, and also one tip that you would give people mm -hmm. in terms of successful relationships. This podcast is about energy, vitality, and motivation. I think great relationships definitely feed into that. So it's interesting. I was just making a list of what I would consider 10 good relationship books. I don't know that I have my one and only um, because I think sometimes it depends if people want something a little bit more philosophical or more um, um, directive. I think that one of the books that will still remain for me very crucial too. One is the, they're not current actually, they're real classics, The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. Mm -hmm. I think it's still one of the foundational books that really said love is a verb. It's active. It's the man's active engagement. It's not just a permanent state of enthusiasm. It's not about finding the person. It's about being the person. It's not about finding the person to love. It's about being a person who loves. That's really powerful. And I still think this is essential. And then the second book would be the search, a man's search for meaning. Oh, yeah. 
um, by Viktor Frankl because the fundamental belief of Viktor Frankl was that you can't always create your conditions, but you can always choose your attitudes to the condition that is imposed on you. The ultimate freedom of the human being is to choose how they will deal with the situation, even if they can't control the situation. And that's what you have in your relationship. You don't always control the situation, but you have the entire freedom to decide how you're going to deal with it. How do you want to deal with this? Even if your partner is being an absolute jerk, is that what you want to do? Now, in terms of my tips, look, I... Um, I've often taught um, what makes for thriving relationships, right? Um, there's different pieces. I would say definitely our ability to take responsibility, to own what's ours, to go to the other, to say I made a mistake, I, I'm sorry, the ability to just apologize. The ability, if, especially for, like, you work with a lot of, of, of high-motivation entrepreneurs and this and that. You know, every time you miss a meeting and you go home and you say, I'm sorry, I had an important meeting, I couldn't be there, I couldn't be there for the game, I couldn't be there for dinner, I couldn't... You know, you basically are saying, I'm damn important. I'm so important that I couldn't be here. When, in fact, the only reason you could stay late or do the thing you needed to do is because you had a partner who was covering for you. So instead of being apologetic and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so important, you come home and you say, thank you, thank you, I couldn't do it without you. Mm -hmm. That changes the entire equation. Apologize a little bit less and be a little bit more grateful because it will show you your dependency on the other person. You can't, especially if you have a family with kids and this and that, or if you have other obligations, doesn't matter. You know, I can't be gone if you don't have, if you're not the one that is here. And therefore, I have to thank you for being here. If I'm just telling you how important I am that I couldn't be here, I basically make you feel consistently that you're not that important. Touch. Touch is essential. Relationships can exist without sex. They can't exist without touch. We get irritable, depressed, and angry when we are not touched. We are touch creatures. Shut the fuck up on occasion. Not everything must be said. When you talk, always ask yourself, what will be the consequence for the other person to live with what you just said? Not about your need to say things. Sometimes you'll feel better. Your nightmare may be over, but your partner's nightmare is just beginning. So think about the other person. And all the time, do for the other person just because it matters to them, not because you care, not because, because you care, but not because you agree. I don't care about this thing. For me, it means nothing, but it means a heck of a lot to my partner. Do it just to please them, just for them. And for the person who receives it, receive it because it was done just for you. And don't say, I want you to do this because you want it, not because I want it only. No, why else? It's perfectly fine that they do it just for you. Learn to receive it and accept that that you are important, and cherish that. That butter is one of the most smoothing things in a relationship. My ability to do something just because it's important to you mm. and your ability to receive it because you are important to me, even if I personally would be perfectly happy without any of this, without saying, but I, uh, you know, Learn to receive, because that makes the other person's giving worth it. And that capacity of giving and receiving like that in a relationship goes a long way. That's fantastic. Esther, thank you so much for, for all your work and everything that you do. I know you've been inspiring so many people here. Um, where can people find out more about you, all the articles you've written, okay. and obviously your new book, which is out? Right. So, Mating in Captivity was the first book. Uh, it's translated in 26 languages. You find it everywhere. The State of Affairs just came out this week in the UK as well. Um, it's going to be everywhere. It is also on audio. And in the audio version, which I read, there is also the podcast, excerpts of the podcast, mm. which is called Where Should We Begin?, which is me inviting you into my office, listening in on unscripted, anonymous, real couples counseling sessions. They're not my patients, they're people who applied for the podcast, but it is as clear an invitation into the backstage 
you hear other couples and you basically are hearing yourself. So there is, where should we begin? There is the state of affairs. There is my website, estherperel.com. And on the website, you're going to find stuff for you if you have just gone through the experience of infidelity and the webinars I'm going to offer you. And if you are a coach or an educator or a therapist, I have an entire platform that I call Sessions with Esther Perel that you will find on my website that basically brings to you all the people from whom I have learned. So instead of creating my school, I created my salon where I invite the people who have inspired me so that we can have an interdisciplinary, global, inclusive platform for all the people who are working in the field of relationships mm. and social, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on all three. Um, this is my work. I think I should finish with that. My work, my life's work, is about helping people navigate the challenges of modern relationships who have become more and more complex and we're making it up as we go. Because I believe that it's the quality of our relationships that determines the quality of our life. And I imagine a world in which you can all experience your relationships with aliveness and with vitality. And that's what I'm guiding you to. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, the wonderful Esther Perel. Thank you so much to Esther for coming on Zestology. And if you found something that you can take away from this, if this interview has had an impact on your relationship in any way, do let me know. I would love to kind of keep this conversation going in some ways. I opened up a little bit there as well, and I have a feeling that I'm going to be listening back to that two or three times, genuinely, because there was some stuff I just couldn't take in at the moment, but I, I could tell it was powerful. So um, I hope you find it useful as well, and I hope it helps your relationships in a positive way. I'm really glad to be able to bring Esther's work to more people in the UK, people who read Balance magazine, people who listen to Zestology, and anyone who might want to put a little bit more zest into their relationships, just perk them up a little bit um, and improve them. So get in touch, use your ways, all the social media, Tony at TonyWriting.com as well. Hope you found this podcast useful. If you know someone who's going a bit through a bit of a relationship hard time, maybe you'd want to share this podcast with them. That would be awesome as well. And as always, thank you for listening to Zestology. <laughs>